so you have like some nodes in the graph, like this, for example. And we want to find the best path. Well, this is a very simple graph. Uh, we want to find the best path, let's say, from some source to some destination. Now, you know, uh, remember, first, uh, let's remember how BFS works to do this. BFS works when you want to minimize the number of hops, right? You want to minimize the number of, like, you know, uh, edges you have to traverse to get to the destination. And the way BFS works is there's kind of like this uh, physical analogy that helps understand it, which is that of like, flood fails, so you, you kind of pour water on A, and in one unit of time, water can propagate along an edge. So at time zero, you kind of fill in A, and then at time one, you fill it, you explore the neighbors of A, and those are B and C, and so at time one, you fill them out, and then you explore the neighbors of B and C, which collectively are, you know, A and D. But A is already flooded, so you don't, you know, you don't put two here, but you, but D is not flooded, so you put the next number here. And so, uh, remember we discussed uh, that, like, we, we saw in one of the past sessions the pseudocode for this, it's, you know, you basically kind of advance a wave front, so you start with just this node, and this is like the nodes visited at time zero, and then you get the set of all nodes that are going to be visited at time one. Uh, and then when, when you're done with that, you get, the, you get the set of all nodes that are visited at time two, which are whatever are the neighbors of the nodes that were visited at time one uh, that are not already covered elsewhere. And those are ones that are distance two. Uh, so, you know, we saw this in quite some detail in past sessions, so I won't recap this more. Uh, but hopefully, you know, like, hopefully you remember this, because, like, everything kind of builds on that, so... Uh, hopefully people are familiar with this algorithm. And, you know, we saw, like, how some people optimize this to use a queue instead of having to use, like, a set for each level. You know, you can end up using a queue, but that's just an implementation optimization. Uh, so what is the, like, weighted shortest path problem? Uh, so weighted would be, uh, you know, your edges can have weights, and you're trying to optimize, basically, you're trying to minimize the total cost. So here you have, uh, you know, here you have this, and instead of having, instead of trying to minimize the total number of hops, which, uh, you know, from, if going from A to D, oh, what's that? Rattling in the back. Is that just like the window? It's the window. Yeah, it's the window. Like oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I guess it can't be helped. That's fine. I just wanted to make sure nobody's like accidentally rattling it. Okay. Uh, it can be helped. Alright. Uh, so, uh, so instead of minimizing the number of hops, in the weighted version, you want to minimize the total cost of the path. And the cost of the path is like there, there'll be like a weight on each edge. Uh, for example, 50, 60, you know, 40, and, you know, 70. And you want to find the path that has the minimum sum of costs. So uh, here, like, like in the unweighted version, we could choose either ABD and ACD, and those were equivalent. They each had, you know, uh, path of size 2. But here we would want to be able to choose specifically this path, because this one is the, you know, the better path. Uh, because this has a sum of 100, that's a lower cost than a sum of 120. So, you know, we want to choose, like, the cheapest, uh, you know, the cheapest path from A to D. And so, we, the output we would expect, uh, you know, a correct algorithm for weighted choice paths to give us would be a, would be like, you know, for, for the path like A to C to D. Uh, and what can this be used for? Well, obviously, like, one, uh, one good example we saw in the past is, uh, you know, uh, road traffic, right? Optimizing, uh, optimizing travel time. Now, it's true that, you know, when you use Google Maps, it doesn't just directly use the extra algorithm, and the reason is because it operates at such massive scale that, uh, and as we'll see, the extra algorithm is actually quite efficient, but it's only quite efficient in the sense that it, it runs in time that is, well, we'll see exactly what, it, what the time complexity is later, but, it, but an optimized version of it runs in time that is close to linear with the size of the input. Uh, so in terms of like running efficiently, it's pretty efficient, but the problem is that, uh, you know, if you have five billion roads in the world, that's still not, even, even linear time is still not good. You would like to pre-process your inputs in some way so that, you know, you can return the answers much faster than just scanning. You don't want to have to scan through all of your data every time, right? Or maybe you can't even hold all of your data on a single machine. 
So uh, even a linear time algorithm is like maybe not very good for something like Google Maps. Uh, so so you know Google Maps, you know it, it doesn't exactly use the exponential algorithm, but uh, it builds on the same kind of like 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 those algorithms would build on the same kind of principles that we're going to see here. Uh, so. Hopefully everybody understands the statement of the problem. It's basically find, you know, find the path from the source to the destination that has the minimum sum of weights. So the total cost of this path is 100, 60 plus 40, and the total cost of this path is 50 plus 70. Uh, and, and you might understand that like the shortest path is not always the one even with uh, the least number of hops, right? Because it's it's pretty trivial to see that, like, okay, um, you know, we we can we can give a pretty trivial example here, where, uh, like, let's say we had ten and ten here. The shortest path now, the the path that is now the correct solution to this problem, is not even the one with the least number of hops, right? Uh, the you know shortest path will now become something like this. And this has a weight of 70 versus a possible weight of 40. And so you actually want to take the path with more hops rather than less if you want to minimize the total distance. And, and that corresponds to how, like, when you're driving on the road, the, you know, the path with the least number of turns is not necessarily optimal. Uh, sometimes it is, but sometimes, you know, if you make more turns, you can actually reduce your total distance or your total travel time, right? So, uh, in, in something like a road network, the way you would the way you would likely model it, at least the small instance of it, is uh, you know you can make all the street intersections essentially nodes because that, those are kind of like the decision points where you choose which way to turn, uh, and then uh, let edges be connecting the stretches of road between. Uh, you know, these are basically roads. These edges represent the stretch of road between two street intersections. And uh, this number can be like either distance or prefer. I, I mean, ideally, if you want to provide the best navigation for your users, hopefully it's like time, right? Time that maybe is even adjusted depending on like real time traffic conditions. That would be like the best for a navigation app. But if you don't have that information, maybe it's just distance or, or distance divided by speed limit or you know something, some some reasonable metric, and then you try to optimize it and find you know the best. Uh, and if you want to kind of uh, sort of artificially pressure your algorithm towards finding solutions that are, uh, you know, may, like maybe all things being equal, you kind of prefer solutions that have fewer, you know, fewer edges, fewer turns. Uh, you could artificially add like a small number to each edge. Like you could basically say, oh, okay, uh, every time I turn, you know, I'm just going to penalize that by 15 seconds. And so maybe you know you can find a solution that kind of balances the number of uh, number of turns versus number of uh, versus total time. Like maybe, you know maybe not having to make a turn is worth 15 seconds to me. Okay, so let's look at one way to tackle this problem. So I'm going to start with kind of like the rendered obvious way to tackle this problem, and then we'll see uh, well we'll see how it can be improved. Because you know, a big part of my goal in these sessions is to make these concepts like very kind of intuitive, not just like uh, the, like the problem with a lot of like algorithms resources out there is they just kind of tell you like here's the algorithm, uh, you know, uh, and they don't always give like enough intuition for like how the concepts are derived. So I, I kind of do tend to emphasize that in these sessions. So let's you know look at one example. So let's say you have. You know, something like this. Okay, so yeah, I'll just put the same example back for now. And let's say you have like, I don't know, two, three, uh, two, or, you know, two, three, four, and two, or something, right? So, uh, in other words, you have weights that are like basically very small integers on, on the labels. Well, what's kind of like a really obvious way to solve this problem? Any like ideas of what you can do if like this is for like this case? Well, but how? Yeah, so like the shortest, that's the definition of the shortest path problem, right? Uh, 
okay, brute force enumerated all the paths from A to B. Well, let's say we don't want to do that because we like we want to give an approach that like maybe for now it's not going to scale to like large numbers on these weights, but it will scale to like large graphs. Like like your graph could still have thousands of nodes. Ah, uh, so yeah, brute force enumerating all the paths. By the way, there's like in the general case there can be like exponentially many paths between two places in a graph. Uh, if you want to demonstrate this, like the easy way to see this is just just imagine like a directed graph, for example. Uh, also true for undirected graphs, but imagine a directed graph, for example, that is kind of structured like this. And then here somewhere is your destination. And this just is like a repeated structure that continues like this. Uh, and this, you know, uh, repeats in this pattern. So what's the idea here? Uh, you know, for each vertex, you can choose a vertex independently out of these two, right? So essentially, if you have n of these layers here, you'll have at least, you know, you'll have at least uh, two to the n paths to the destination. That that basically shows that the number of paths can be exponential if you were to enumerate them all, uh, because you know each choice can be made independently here, right? So if you have n layers, that's two to the n possible paths at least. So, okay, we don't want to enumerate all the paths. Uh, any any other ideas? Greedy approach? No, greedy, well, greedy doesn't work. So by greedy approach means, uh, uh, you know, like just take the, try the smallest edge first. I mean, no, I mean, there's not really any reason why that would work. Okay, well, I'll, you know, I'll show you what I have. So you can see if I were to use the previous construction, 
you, you can really see how like this would this could not be efficient, right? Uh, because you know I'd have to put 300 intermediate nodes here. But uh, you know, just to give us insight, let's uh, let's try it. So you know, I have this long chain here to be right, and I'm saying that this has 300 nodes. And I have this like long chain here to E, and this has 500 nodes. And I have this long chain here to uh, to C, right? And this has 400 nodes. Well, okay, what's going to happen at time one here? In the in the VFS that runs on this graph, what is going to happen? Well, first of all, at time zero, I mark A, right? What's going to happen at the next unit of time? Right? What, what happens at a unit of time two? Do any of these vertices, like, do any, like there's stuff coming out of here, right? Uh, there's stuff over here, right? Uh, do any of these things come into play at time two? What do you think? No, not at all, right? Because they're very far away. Uh, only these come, come into play at time two, right? So, so here's what happens at time two. Here's what happens at time three, time four. <laughs> so are, are you maybe starting to see the insight here? Uh, this is getting really repetitive, right? Like, uh, all I'm doing every iteration is I'm just like, oh, okay, mark the next thing in this, mark the next thing in this, mark the next thing in this. So here's what I would like to do. I would like to fast forward in time to a point where something interesting happens. What will be the first point at which something interesting happens. Now, of course, that's not well defined, but what do you think? When, when does something interesting happen? Yeah, when B is reached, right? And why is that? Because nothing else can happen until one of these three flows completes through to this to one of these vertices, right? Like, like until one of these, one of these, whichever one it is, reaches here, reaches its destination, no more flows are started, it's just traveling along these like existing three lines, right? So I can kind of skip all that work of labeling these individual nodes, uh, I cannot have these individual nodes, and I can just skip forward in time to when one of these nodes is visited. So how do I do that? Well, I have to consider which of these nodes is going to be visited first. Um, and now, you know, one thing I do want to caution about is uh, I did make an assumption in kind of how I set this up. I'm assuming that all the weights here are essentially positive numbers. The whole analogy to BFS doesn't really work if the weights can actually be negative. But a negative weight is a strange thing, right? A negative weight is like a road that gives you back time if you travel it. Uh, so in some kind of context, it can't occur, right? Or at least not that we know of. Uh, and... Uh, but in other contexts, like, there are some occasional contexts in which you can see edges with negative weight in a way that's perfectly legitimate, and those will not be able to be covered by Dijkstra's algorithm because Dijkstra's algorithm is derived from this idea of essentially uh, being a generalization of BFS. And because of that, there's no way to model, like, like if I have negative 500 here, there's no way to model that because it doesn't correspond to anything in the BFS, right? Like, a weight of 500 corresponds to 500 nodes here, but uh, a weight of negative 500 doesn't correspond to anything. You might also say that fractions don't correspond to anything. What is, like, what if this was 0 0.5? What does that correspond to? But we'll see later that for, like, fractions are not, are not a problem for Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, because it's easily enough generalized, like, you can always, even if you did have decimals, you can always, uh, you can always kind of, like, get it to kind of, you can always think of it as integers by just multiplying but multiplying all the weights by a large enough number. I mean, that's not like technically accurate, but, uh, you know, you can imagine if you have a decimal like 0 0.0058, if you multiply this by, you multiply all the weights by 10,000, you get an integer weight of 58. Uh, now, you know, not all, obviously, like, that only works for terminating decimals, but uh, we'll see later that, you know, for Later we'll see kind of rigorously that fractions are not a problem for the algorithm. But negative numbers are going to be a problem, and they're going to have to be solved in some other way. You're not going to be able to use the extra algorithm for graphs that have negative weights. But, like we said, negative weights are a pretty rare case, because if you think about it, like a road network can't have negative weights. Um, uh, a lot of other things can't have negative weights. 
like probably if you have like airline tickets, and these represent the costs, right? And these represent cities. Uh, again, probably every airline ticket has a positive cost. And we're also going to see later that the next algorithm does allow a cost to be zero. Like it's it's fine for a cost to be zero uh, under the next algorithm, but we'll need a separate illustration of that. So back to this, like you can see clearly here that nothing interesting happens until one of these vertices is reached. And in fact, if uh, the the vertex that has the least travel time from A, like if we view these as like travel times, the vertex that has the least travel time from A, uh, whichever one that is, we're going to we're going to discover the shortest path to it, right? Because whichever one whichever one of these is visited first we're already going to know the shortest path to that vertex. You know, because VFS does reach one of these vertices first. And then once one of these vertices is reached, like once the B is reached, you know, some other interesting stuff is going to start where there's going to be, you know, flow along this line. So one way you can describe it, and we're not really starting to put this in pseudocode yet, we haven't figured out the whole algorithm here yet, but uh, clearly, like, we're going to want, okay, we're going to want some structure that stores the uh, like it's something like akin to a distance map in DFS, where we are, you know, storing and mapping between nodes and, and their distances for nodes whose distances are already known. So we're going to have, want to have like a distance mapping here. And initially, this comes seeded with, uh, you know, A maps to Z. So, uh, you know, originally the distance map has this information in it, right? And we label this as zero to indicate that the shortest path to this is zero. Okay. And also, we have something that we're going to call like uh, candidates. So, what are candidates? Uh, candidates are basically the next, uh, the possible next nodes that could be visited based on the nodes we visited already. So, here in the candidate set, we're going to have B, E, and C because these, like one of these three nodes has to be the nodes that are visited next, right? Because we already said nothing interesting is happening until one of these nodes is hit, right? Until one of these nodes is hit, we're just kind of doing the same thing, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eventually we get to 300 and we hit this node. Uh, but how do we know that it was going to know V node V that gets hit first? It's because it has the smallest number, right? So that suggests some kind of minimum finding among these. So the idea is we should put all of these nodes into our candidate set. So, so here we're going to say we have a candidate of B at, at 300. So this is the time at which it happens. We calculate this 300. We take the time that A was visited, which was 0. And then because A was visited at time 0 and this edge costs 300, 0 plus 300 suggests that B will be visited at time 300. So B will be visited at time 300. Uh, E is going to be visited at time 500, and C is going to be visited at time 400. Now, uh, it's very well worth noting that this label, for example, of 500 here, this is a common point of confusion about the extra algorithm, so you know, you be sure you understand this. Uh, this E of 500, this does not imply that vertex E will be visited at time 500. As you can tell, that's not going to be the case here. Like, vertex E should be visited at time 350 from here. So this, it does not mean that vertex E is going to be visited at 500. Uh, it just means that we have a flow, like this one, that will visit E at time 500. So logically that implies that E will be visited either at time 500 or some earlier time. Because we, what we're saying is we already have some some knowledge of something that will visit E at time 500. Uh, we, it, it doesn't mean that that is the earliest time at which E will visit uh, And, you know, just to kind of uh, clarify the situation, uh, you know, I'm going to insert another column, which is going to have the vertex A here, and this is basically just uh, saying that this is the flow from vertex A. So, in other words, the, the columns here, um, you know, these are the candidates, and the, the columns here are basically vertex, time, the time at which it will be visited, and, you know, from vertex. This is what vertex the flow originally came from. As you might imagine, this information is also going to be used to trace back the path later. 
Uh, like after we find you know the shortest path, this kind of information can be used to like back link to like what node did you come from and discover the actual path. Uh, you know, just like in BFS, remember we had such a field we introduced like a backlink field so that we could you know travel back along the path and figure out where we came from, right? So it's going to be the same here. Uh, okay, so yeah, we have this mapping of vertices and distances, and we also have. Uh, and already here, like, you know, we can tell we're probably going to want to store, you know, this backlink as well. When we discover a distance, we're going to store this kind of backlink. Now, the first node has no backlink, it just has null. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have something like that. And this is kind of similar to the setup for DFS, except in DFS this was all a queue, and it didn't have these numbers here. In BFS this was all kind of in a queue, and it just had, you know, uh, we just had this kind of information, and we just had a queue of these vertices. Uh, okay, so how do we go from here? We need to process the minimum value, right? And like, in other words, we uh, need to find at which point does something exciting happen here. So like we said, this 500 does not mean that the shortest path to E is 500, but however, we can conclude that whichever of these is the smallest, whether it's this 300, 500, 400, whichever one of these is the smallest, is in fact a shortest path. And why is that? It's because nothing else can happen until one of these in the set is visited. And so when one of these is actually reached by the flow, we will have the shortest path to it. So uh, what do we do? Okay, so we should, we should, in the next iteration, remove the smallest one. And now what, what is happening is we're going to transfer this over here. So B gets an entry of 300 from vertex A here. And now what we're saying is that, look, uh, we fast forward in time to this point of 300. You can think of there being like a global time variable that is set to 300. Okay, so we fast forward it in time to time 300 because that's the first time in which something interesting happens, right? Okay, so now that basically means that, you know, uh, B has been visited at time 300. And you can extend the sort of BFS water analogy here. You can imagine that you're pouring water on vertex A, and unlike BFS where just every, every adjacent vertex gets flooded in one unit of time, uh, here every this represents the amount of time it takes water to travel to the other, you know, you know, to the to the vertex. This is like a pipe, right? And this pipe, you know, it takes 300 units of time for water to flow from here to here. And at time 300, we visit uh, you know, this vertex. And, but this pipe is longer, and it takes 500 units of time. And this pipe takes 400 units of time. So here we have, you know, vertex A was flooded at time zero. And now we are in this state, where the time is 300, vertex B is flooded. There's some flow coming from A to E that hasn't propagated all the way yet. And there's some flow coming from A to C, which hasn't propagated all the way yet. And that is our current state. And now, we also have to add one more thing, which is that now that B is flooded, these pipes can start flooding, right? So, as we process this B, we remove this B in here, we put it here. Now we have to add the neighbors of B to this Q. Now, kind of a simpler version that doesn't require many optimizations. Uh, one thing we can do is we could just add all the neighbors of B to this. So what we can do is we can say, okay, um, what are the neighbors of B? It is actually A, E, and D. So uh, at what time, okay, at what time are we going to reach D? Uh, it's going to be 300 plus 500, right? It's not just 500. You have to add in the time that it took you to get to your current spot. So our current time is, current global time is 300. We add in this 500, and therefore we're going to get to D at time 800, reached from the vertex D. Okay? Uh, hopefully this makes sense so far. Okay, now, we also have a flow that is starting in this direction. And this flow is going to say that we reach vertex E at time 350 from the vertex B. Now, you might already notice something interesting here, which is that we have two entries for E, right? 
So which of these two entries do you think ought to be kept? The smaller one, right? Because we don't care about the larger one. We only care about the first time in which something is hit. So we're going to discard this one, and we're going to keep this one. Uh, but for now, just to simplify the implementation, uh, I'm just going to keep them both. And what I'm going to do is, whenever I process an entry from the candidates, whenever I extract the minimum from here, and I process the entry from the candidates, I'm first going to check if I've already reported a smaller distance to it. And if I haven't, then I will report it. But if, for example, I process this entry, and at the time I process this entry, I already have an entry here that says E was reached at time 350, then I will just, you know, ignore this entry. And we'll see how that makes it makes like a very, very simple implementation of Dijkstra's algorithm possible. But then we can come back and we can do this optimization, where we're going to kind of like keep the cube smaller, keep this candidates list smaller by trimming out unnecessary entries like this 500. Uh, okay, and you know, might as well and, and insert an entry for A too. Like obviously you can see that A is going to be useless here because A is already visited at time zero, so there's no way that like if we insert an entry for A, we're going to do anything with it. But here, you know, I'll go ahead and insert this A at time 600 because you know 300 plus this 300 is 600. So I'll go ahead and insert that, but when, when, when you can see that when this gets processed, like, th you're going to immediately reject it based on the fact that you already have a better value for A. Um, and if you wanted to, you could of course do an optimization, just check if it's already in the distance map, and then don't put it in. I'm just trying to keep this as minimal as possible. Uh, yeah, as minimally as possible, you could even put it in here, and just like reject it later. Uh, okay, so this is what is in our candidate set now. This is like these are the entries I well this entry uh, yeah this entry this entry and this entry are what I inserted when I visited B. So in other words, uh, for every vertex, we're going to insert all of its edges once as entries here. Okay, uh, does everything make sense so far? Uh, any uh, questions thus far? I want to pause and stop for a second. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we reached uh, vertex B, and we, as you can see, we updated the distance map here. Would we also add E and D right now? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, okay, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is, like, why have we not added E and D to the distance map? Well, there's a good reason. It's because E and D have not actually been reached yet. So it is the current time is global time is 300. At time 300, D and E have not yet been reached. At the current time, so far, we've just started pouring water on A, and the pipe has just reached a D. And we also have some other flows in progress, right? These are basically kind of like the, the water flows that are in progress. So we have this flow in progress at time 300. We have this one in progress. It hasn't reached yet. Uh, we have this flow in progress, because we just reached this one, and now we're starting to flow along this edge. And we're starting to flow along this edge. There's currently no flow along this edge because we haven't reached C yet at all. Uh, and there's no flow along this edge either because we haven't reached E at all. And E and D are not in the distance map because even though we have flows that are coming to them, uh, we are we have not reached them yet. This is, this is for nodes that we even have reached. Or and the shortest. Yes. So whatever is in this distance map are like the nodes we have already reached, and because we have reached them, because we have basically simulated BFS up to the point where we reach them, we know that this is the shortest path to them. Because essentially our steps, like, like the one way to reason about the correctness of this is we just are saying that this is just a simulation of what would have happened here. And we already know that BFS is a correct algorithm, so if we just establish that what we're doing is equivalent to what the BFS would have done for the vertices we care about, uh, then that establishes the correctness of the approach. Now, you know, we, we will be able to get like a more, you know, concise proof of uh, the correctness of this algorithm too, uh, but just as a, you know, kind of preliminary, like we can just say that we are simulating the effects. That's how we derive this algorithm. We are just simulating the effects. So here, uh, if the current time is 300, we have reached node B. We have, that means that basically BFS is now marking the B as 300 over here. Like we are getting this marking, which means that this is the shortest path to B. However, we have not yet reached E. So, so even though we calculated this candidate of 500, 
That's just bookkeeping for our simulation. Our VFS has not actually marked E as 500. This is, this is important to understand. Like, this is a simulation of VFS. E has not, absolutely not been marked at 500, nor will it ever be, because E is going to be 350, right? Uh, and that would be necessary for this to be correct. Uh, okay, so th this is just bookkeeping. The, uh, why do we keep this? This is so that we have all the candidates for what might be the next vertex to get visited by VFS. Right? Like, like one of these vertices has to be the next vertex that is visited by the algorithm. Uh, you know, why is that? Just because all the flows that are currently active at this time, at time 300, are stored in here. So one of them has to be the one that reaches its vertex next. And, on, and so these are all the ongoing flows, and until one of them reaches its vertex, nothing else exciting happens, right? So the pattern again repeats. You know, you have 300 here, you have, you have 300 here, you have 300 here, and now nothing exciting happens. You just go like, okay, 301, 301, 301, you know? And again, like nothing exciting happens until one of these time points is reached. So at which time point does the next exciting event happen? Well, it's whatever is the minimum of these. So it is this one, right? Okay, so I should go ahead and select this one. And, you know, I'll move it into this distance map. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, hold that question. So, so the question is, was like, what is basically, in essence, the question was like, what is this data structure? Uh, not known right now. This is we're we're trying to evaluate this conceptually, and so how are we going to choose what data structure to use here? We're going to choose it on the basis of thinking about what operations it requires, right? So until we know the algorithm, we don't know what data structure we should choose here. We just know what logical operations we want, and then once we have the algorithm, we'll be like, okay. We know what logical operations we want. Now we just have to pick a data structure that supports that efficiently. Uh, so we don't know. Uh, but clearly, it has to be something that's good at like picking out the minimum, right? That's kind of a strong hint as to what data structure it might be. But it's something that's good at picking out the minimum, obviously. Uh, OK, so uh, you know, we, we got this part done. Uh, so it's, it's effectively, that means we have reached the stage where this has become flooded with water and marked at time 350. Now we can see that this flow, well, this flow still hasn't reached at time 350, right? But this flow is now relevant. It's not going to do anything because it's already marked. This, this has already come from here to be marked at 350. OK, this one is still not visited. And now we have a new flow starting, right? Well, technically, we have this one starting, this one starting, and this one starting. But uh, we, we can tell that most of these aren't going to do anything, but you know, we'll insert them for kicks anyway, just to see what happens, right? Just so we can see that inserting these extra entries is not really a problem. Uh, okay, so now we get, now we're going to insert these three entries. So the current time is 350. So now I need to add you know, each weight to this. So at time 350 and flowing this way, you would visit the at time. 400 from B. Uh, here you're going to visit A at time 850 from B, 350 plus 500. And you're going to visit D at time, oops, uh, you're going to visit D at time, at, at what time? At 650 from B. So were any of these entries productive? Well, here, no, because B is in the dictionary. A, no, because this is in the dictionary. Uh, and D, uh, yes, because this is actually a better entry than this one. So you, you're, we're kind of already kind of anticipating the optimizations where we're going to get rid of these like duplicate entries. But I just want to show what happens if you don't, don't get rid of them. It's not a problem as long as you're doing the proper checks. Uh, OK, so you know, and this picture is getting very cluttered, but you know, in this picture, the flow has reached this point. Uh, OK, this picture is getting clutter is no longer useful. Going to get rid of it. All right. So now these are our entries. Now, again, we have to pick out the minimum. 
So now there's two entries that are actually minimal, and the situation is it doesn't matter which one you pick if two things are, you know, both minimal. It just means that, you know, in the BFS picture, they would have been hit in the same wavefront, right? So it, it doesn't matter which one you process first. Just like BFS, you know, like if you have two nodes that are exactly the same distance, it doesn't care which one you process first. Uh, so, you know, just pick one of these. So let's say we decide to process B, but at this point, when we process B, we have to make sure we do this check. This is similar to the old, to the visited check of BFS, right? Where when it's time to process this, we check if it's already in the map, and if we already have a better distance to it, we don't process it. Uh, and since things are found in order of distance, just by the fact that B is a key in this map at all, it implies that B is already has a smaller distance, right? Because we're visiting nodes, like notice what's happening, we're visiting nodes in, in order of their distance from A. That is what Dijkstra's algorithm is really doing. Dijkstra's algorithm is visiting nodes in order of their distance from A. <clears throat> because it's essentially simulating BFS, right? And BFS visits its nodes in order of the distance. And this is why it's going to be very suitable for shortest paths. Like, for example, if you ever mark with a distance the nodes you're interested in, you know you're done, and you can actually stop. Okay, so this B does nothing. This B just immediately fails due to a check that checks if it's in this map. Okay, let's process. Now, now we have another node to process, C. Okay, so C is actually not in this map, so that's great. That basically means we found another node. 400, okay. Yeah, so, so C is visited at a time 400, and now C is also shaded in, it's, meaning it's been, it's been visited and placed into our distance map. Okay. So then, so then okay, C is removed from the queue. And when I, uh, and when I remove C from the queue, uh, well, okay, I should add its neighbors too, which is, uh, uh, Okay, so let's let's add C's neighbors to the queue. Uh, so this is going to be A at time 800 from C, and also it's going to be D at time D at time. Uh, the current time is 400 plus 300, 700 from from C. Okay, but this 700 is not as good as the 650 we already have. Uh, so in the optimized version, we would get rid of this entry. All right, so here are all our entries. Oh, and this one's gone. This one's processed. So now we just have to take the next smallest one, which is which one? Oh, it looks like it's this one, but E is already in our map, right? So this corresponds to the case where finally this flow that was costing 500 from A to E completed. So now we're at time 500 and this has completed, but this is useless because we already covered this. So uh, at, the, at the time that I remove this entry from the map, I will just check it here, and look, uh, this is already here, so I just don't do anything with it. Uh, you know, you got to make sure you don't even visit its neighbors or anything like that. Like, we don't want to add any more entries to the queue for this one. Uh, okay, so uh, now next entry. What is the next entry? Okay, it's this one. Well, A is already in the map, so again, this entry does nothing. That's just a quick check on the map. This does nothing. Okay. Uh, 650. Oh, okay, and now the next one is we find our target node. Uh, we see D. D is not in the map. D also matches our destination. So that means that at time 650, we have visited this from this edge. So uh, at this point, you know, um, we're kind of running out of space here, but, you know, at this point you can see that uh, here we're going to insert D and that with the entry 650. And where did we come from? Okay. So now, uh, you know, just like in BFS, where sometimes, you know, sometimes the version of the problem we wanted to solve is just like run the algorithm until you're done. Uh, run the algorithm until you actually have like a value for each vertex, right? And no more edges to explore. In which case, we keep processing these, but you can see that all of these are going to fail, right? You can see that all of these, like, S, so, so this one's already gone. Uh, you can see that for the rest of these, it's just going to fail in this check of, like, do you already have the, the better distance to it, right? Uh, so this will be processed in no time, and then we'll say the algorithm is over because we have no more, we have no more edges to explore. Alternatively, you can, if you actually meant to find the distance between a source and a specific destination, rather than from a source to all possible destinations, 
then you can just terminate, you can just add a check into your code where you say, is the currently prop no is the node that I just added to the distance map the destination node? If yes, just quit. Uh, so, so here maybe we just quit. Uh, and now we can actually recover the path too by just using this traceback mechanism. So we see that D was reached at time 650. So this is the total value of the path. The shortest path we discovered from A to D is 650. And it's discovered it from E. So that means I can do this sort of traceback where I go from D. From, from, from D, I go to E. And from E, I again look the shortest path from E. What vertex was it from? Oh, look, it was from vertex B. And the shortest path from B, what vertex was it from? Uh, it was from A. And then A has, well, A, you can just detect A as being the start vertex. Alternatively, you can see this null, and now you turn it. And so this is the reverse path. This is, you know, the trace back from D. So the forward path is just the reverse of this. Okay, so, and, and this gives us our path, A, B, E, D, with a total cost of 650. So, uh, this is basically how the extra algorithm works. Now we can talk about, like, how to implement it in the most efficient way. But this is basically the core, uh, like, the core concept of Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, that essentially at any given time, you maintain a distance map of the vertices that, like, the, you know, DFS in this case would have visited already. And you maintain a candidates map of what flows are currently ongoing. You know, what, like, chains of vertices in that DFS simulation you would be still traveling along. And at any given time, you just say, okay, I'm going to fast forward to the next interesting event in time. And the next interesting event in time is the one that occurs at the least time out of everything in the candidates. So we're just going to pick the candidate with the lowest time, and we're going to process it. And when we process it, we basically say, well, first of all, is this a new vertex that we didn't know the distance to before? If no, then just ignore it. If yes, then add it to the distance map and process all the new flows that are out, coming out of it. You know, add to its candidates all of its outbound edges. You know, add to the candidates map all of that vertex's outbound edges with a time that is basically the current time plus the cost of the edge. Because that would be, you know, like if I reach D at time 300, then along this edge I will reach D at time 800. And you remember that, you know, whatever values in the candidates, like if you see a value like this in the candidates, that does not mean D will be reached at time 800, it just means D will be reached at time 800 from the vertex D. D can be reached at time, say, 650 at some smaller time from some other vertex like E. And that's what explains it. There's no inconsistency here. You know, uh, D is in fact reached at time 800 from the vertex B, it just it happens to reach it at an earlier time, you know, from the vertex E. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I will discuss this a little more in just a minute, but uh, any questions thus far? Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think this is like this version of uh, kind of this way of thinking about it is intuitive if you like understand BFS. This is just a simulation of BFS. That's like all it is. Uh, okay, so let's talk about you know a couple couple issues here. Well, first of all, what what do you think the best way to implement this is going to be? Uh, okay, so so what implementation do we need? Okay, so we need some kind of distance map, right? And now the distance map, uh, what operations does it need to support? Well, it seems like we do a lot of checking, right? We need to do, we need to make that check fast, where when we take out a candidate, we check whether it's already in the distance map, right? So that does suggest some kind of map structure. That suggests I was right to kind of write this as I did in BFS, where this is some kind of map structure. I mean, it could be like a direct, like this map, I mean, if your nodes are labeled like zero to n minus one, you could make it like a direct axis array. Like if you're, if instead of having arbitrary labels, your nodes have labels zero to n minus one, okay, maybe you can create an array of size n and use a direct axis. But essentially, the concept, the logical concept, is that of mapping. Uh, it's it's that I want to keep a mapping of every vertex to its distance and where I came from to get to that distance. And I want to maintain this in some structure that's not just a list, but some kind of map so I can check membership keys efficiently. Uh, so clearly this should be some kind of map, like maybe a hash table, 
right? Or a direct access array if your keys are in a given range. But otherwise, like just like a hash table is fine. So that's the choice of data structure here. It's basically the same as for DFS. Direct access array or map, depending on what type your labels are. Uh, how about uh, in the candidates? What, what, what uh, data structure do you think we should use here? So what operations did we ever do on the candidates? There's actually only one operation we, well, no, two operations we do on the candidates, right? Two. Uh, we do insert, like we add new stuff to the candidates as we go, right? And we also do remove min, where based on a particular value, like we can consider this value the key, we remove the thing with the least key. So uh, what data structure do you think you ought to choose? Priority key. Yeah, priority key. That makes sense. I mean, you could also go with a BST or something like that. Huh? Tree set? Yeah, you could also go with a tree set, which is essentially like a BST implementation. Yeah. Uh, like, you could, because, you know, trees also do offer efficient remove min. But, uh, you know, priority keys are likely to have, like, a somewhat better constant factor because they're just, they're just kind of simpler data structures that don't provide the full range of operations that trees have, right? Uh, you know, by the way, like, uh, this is like an important point that like a lot of people don't realize. Like, when would you use a tree instead of a priority queue in like just an arbitrary data structures problem? Well, usually it's because the tree has more capabilities than a priority queue, right? A priority queue basically only offers you uh, efficient like find min, remove min, and insert. Whereas a tree can also do things like not only find min, remove min, and insert, a tree could also find arbitrary elements. It can also delete arbitrary elements and not just the min. You know, you can do stuff like, say, like, delete the element 100 without that being the min. Uh, and trees also have some, like, ordered set operations. Like, you can do stuff like find the, find the nearest value to 10. Like, not find exactly 10, but find, like, the nearest value to 10. Uh, so trees have a variety of additional operations they can do by the fact that the tree structure is essentially sorted. Internally, like a tree is kind of maintaining its keys in a sorted way. Uh, whereas a heap, if you are familiar with how like, priority keys are implemented, heaps, heaps actually do not maintain their keys in a sorted way. Heaps only maintain like a minimal type of ordering between elements that allows them to support these core operations. Remove, like basically remove min, you know, also get min and insert. I mean, if you think about it, if you just have remove min and insert, that's enough to get to get min. Because even though a heap doesn't implement it this way, and it would be kind of inefficient, like, sure, like, uh, you could, to get min, you could always just remove the element and then put it back in, right? So, so actually, like, remove min, if you have efficient remove min and re efficient insert, that guarantees efficient get min. So, of course, a heap implements it even more efficiently if, like, just checks the top element of the heap. So, uh, yeah, so, but here are core operations. We only use two operations, right? And we use two operations. We did, we did uh, insert and we did remove min. So a heap is going to be the perfect choice for us here. All right. So, so, um, now it's basically time to uh, write the pseudocode for this and do a time complexity analysis. Uh, and you know, uh, I, I know this is a long session, so after that we'll have a chance to uh, you know take a break, and then after the break we'll come back and we'll see some problem solving with Dexter's algorithm, some problems where Dexter's algorithm is applied. Um, I guess before I go into this, I want to uh, go over a couple more issues. Like one observation that you may not have necessarily thought of in this way, but this is like an important observation, right? Uh, is that at any given time, what do the candidates actually contain? The candidates contain all of the nodes, like the, the, the vertices that are contained in the candidates at any given time are nodes that are either already in the distance map, if you you know, didn't do the optimization to disallow that. Uh, or nodes that are neighbors of things in the distance map, right? It is definitely, it can never be the case that the candidate set contains anything that is not a neighbor of something in the distance map. 
Why is that? Because the only time something gets added to the candidates map is when you're is when you insert something into the distance map, then you get all of its neighbors and add them here. Right? So at no time can the candidates set have anything that is not a neighbor of your distance map. And the reason this is important is this slide kind of will clearly illustrate to us a simple proof of the correctness of this algorithm, and will also illustrate to us why this can't work if some of the weights are negative. Like, why, why do we have to have the weights be positive? Um, well, it's because basically at any given time, what the extra algorithm is doing is you have some source vertex, and every step in Dijkstra's algorithm, every step that adds something to the distance map, is basically finding the next nearest vertex to A. Like, so there's some set of vertices that are already in the distance map from A, and there's some set of vertices that are not. And at any given time, Dijkstra's algorithm is trying to discover what is the next nearest vertex, right? Basically simulating DFS to that point in time where it finds the next vertex. Uh, so. So let's just say that, like, okay, you were running Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, you know, here's some nodes. And let's say that these nodes, the ones over here, are the ones that are in your candidate map. So, you know, don't look at this now. But let's just say you were, you were running Dijkstra's algorithm, and so far, the nodes in your distance map are these nodes, let's say. Right? Then what Dijkstra's algorithm is doing is you can be sure that, you know, because, because you inserted the neighbors of each vertex into the candidate's map, as you process the vertex and added it to the distance map, you can be sure that whatever's in the candidate's map at this time, like A, includes every possible neighbor of these nodes. Like, you know, just think about like a collective concept of neighbor, where the neighbor of the neighbor of all of these nodes is basically just kind of like the union of the individual neighbors of these nodes, right? So if these are the nodes that have already been visited by Dijkstra's algorithm, then H, F, and G are like the neighbors of this set. Whereas something like I over here is not. Right? Because I there's no edge from any of these to I. So F, G, and H are in the set. And by the way, Dijkstra's algorithm works, you can be sure that F, G, and H are the, are already in your candidate set if these are in your distance map, right? Because because the moment you add something into your distance map, you also add its neighbors. So if these are in your distance map, then since these are neighbors of at least one vertex in here, these are in your candidate set. And likewise, you can be sure that I is not in your candidate set, because the only way I can get added to the candidate set is if F gets processed. But if F was processed, then F would be inside this blue boundary. Uh, this is an important thing to understand, uh, and it kind of shows us like exactly why Dijkstra's algorithm is correct. Dijkstra's algorithm is basically saying to find out what the next. Uh, well, Dijkstra's algorithm is saying is I would like to discover the next nearest node to A. Like, I already know the distance of all of these nodes. I would now like to discover which of the nodes is next in line, has the next shortest distance, right? And, and Dijkstra's algorithm is basically saying that it's got to be one of these nodes out on the frontier. One of these nodes that is not yet in the distance map, but is a node of something in the distance map. And why must that be? Like, if that were not true, then Dijkstra's algorithm would not be correct. But why must that be? Well, you know, you can do like a proof by contradiction, essentially. Like, assume that somehow I were to be the next node in line. Like, suppose I is the next node uh, that, like, is the next nearest node to, to, to A, right? Even though I is not in this candidate set. Uh, but consider it now. So now you have A, and you're claiming that there's going to be some path, you know, to, to the vertex I. Right? And you're claiming that this path is smaller than the shortest path to any other vertex that you've discovered. But consider this. Uh, I mean, I is not a neighbor of this, uh, of this set, right? So that means that I is going to be reached, you know, through some indirect vertex, in this case, F. 
But, you know, we all we know that it's maybe some vertex, right? Some other vertex. But look at that. Uh, because all of the edges are positive, then it would have to be that this one is actually shorter. Like this one is actually, actually has a smaller solution than this one, right? Because, like, I can't be reached from anything that you already discovered. Uh, so it has to be that, like, you know, I is going to be reached from some other intermediate node that you also have not discovered yet. But then, by virtue of these edges being positive, this is, a po this is adding some positive cost to the path. That actually means that there's no way that I can be next in line, right? There's no way that I can be the next shortest path. It has to be that, at the very least, it's this one, if not something even smaller. Uh, so this basically illustrates that, you know, there's no way that, uh, there's no way that anything that's not one of the neighbors is next in line. Uh, and, you know, you can see that this critically relies on the fact that you can assume that an edge is positive. Uh, now, you can extend this proof to a case where the edges are just non-negative. Like, you can say, like, okay, this could, be, this could be zero, right? But if this is zero, then, like, it's true that may maybe I could be tied for next in line. Like, if this is, you know, if this is zero and f is the next vertex to be discovered, then I guess f and i are both next in some sense. So maybe saying i is next is not wrong, but also saying, also if the algorithm just decides that f is next, the algorithm is also not wrong to say that. So as long as this is not negative, if this could be negative, then you have a problem, right? Because let's say this is negative. Now it actually could be true, depending on what happens here, it actually could be true that i is the next nearest vertex to a, despite the fact that it's not in any way connected to this, to this set whose distances have already been found, right? Like, let's say, you know, uh, let's say, you know, distances to things are, like, large or something, and here you have, you know, 20, and this edge comes to, uh, 6, like, maybe, maybe I really is next with a weight of 21, right? Uh, like, this is visited at time 20, and, you know, plus 6, minus 5. This is 21, and F is only visited after that at time 26. Uh, so this can be if the edges are negative. Which is why the algorithm is not correct for cases where edges can be negative. Uh, but if you have this assumption that like f that, that you know i cannot be next because there would be some intermediate node before it that would be at least as small, uh, then you know that establishes that establishes that you could just consider this node instead, and then you know by further reduction you could reduce that up to a point where you're only considering the set of nodes that is neighboring with the set of nodes you've already discovered. And then at any given time, we already said your candidates have all of the nodes that are neighboring to the nodes that you've already discovered. So by finding the min of them, you will definitely find the right solution. So this is worth understanding. And you know, this also leads to like a proof of Dijkstra's algorithm that you know, doesn't depend on saying that this is a simulation of BFS or anything like that. Uh, like now we can just characterize the extra algorithm as basically saying that, okay, uh, at any given time, you know, let my distance map be the set of nodes I already know the distance to. Initially, this is just seeded with A at time A has a distance of zero. And then I can always just consider my neighbors. To, if, I, if I consider all of, my, all of the neighbors of this, you know, blue region, one of them is the next node the next, the, the, the next nearest node to A. And I can just find out what it is and, uh, you know, label it as a shortest path. So now we can just simplify it that way, and now we have no dependency on kind of simulating BFS, which means that we no longer have to, like, assume that the weights are integers or anything like that. Like, we can see that clearly this works for fractions because, uh, you know, this new proof has no dependency on, like, referencing that it's a simulation of BFS. Uh, the, the, depend the only dependency is that we assumed that edges are uh, non-negative. 